So, uh, yeah. So we're on right now with David Whelan, who worked on um, Savage Land, which is a horror movie that came out in 2015. It's kind of a mockumentary about a zombie outbreak. Um, well, the I suppose the whole question with the movie is it a zombie outbreak or not, right? That's kind of that's kind of one of the main themes, the kind of believability of it and how people reacted to it. But it's a very very good movie. Um, so yeah, that's David. <laughs> Hello, it, it is really it's very nice to be here. Thank you for having me. I just want to ask you first about like how it all came together. I guess like how you started making it and like what the production process was like. Certainly, no, it's a great question. So um, I went to uh, grad school uh, in Los Angeles at, at UCLA, uh, and it was in the screenwriting program, and became friends with a couple of other folks in the program. Um, Phil Gidry, who was one of the co-directors, and Simon Herbert, who was another co-director. Um, and the, the way the program worked at UCLA was you'd, you'd be in these like small classes together, and you had to write a lot. You had to write, essentially, a full a feature length script every 10 weeks um which was great it was a really it was a really good exercise and you learn a lot really fast about like what works what doesn't work what ideas work what don't work um and phil and i then were working on um a sports television show um or actually he was working on the show and i was working on something else that shot in the same building um he had connected me with that opportunity and we were the the legitimate uh, origin story of this idea was that we were all everyone who was working on that sports show so i may have actually technically been working on the show at that time we were all given uh, as a thank you gift for maybe like the thousandth episode of the show or the 500th some for some reason we were all given very small cameras uh, as a thank you gift and he and I just started talking one day and like we'd been kicking ideas around. We'd actually not taken many classes, many writing classes together uh, at, at UCLA. Um, but we'd been friends and then we were seeing each other very regularly um, working on this show. And so we were kicking around ideas of like, hey, we should do something with these cameras. Um, and the other thing that we had in, in mind was this was a TV studio that was really only used about an hour, an hour and a half a day. So there's, you know, 22 and a half other hours that it's just sitting dark. So we were kicking around ideas, starting in that, like, what if we used something here and something, you know, um, is there a way to, is there a way to put these cameras to good use? Um, and we really started to talk about some of the movies that we really liked. And, you know, it will probably be no shock that one of the ones that came up was Blair Witch. And one of the things that I really have always appreciated about that movie was it had limitations, it had budget limitations. Right. They made those work for them, as opposed to trying to fake something else. Yeah, and you see that a lot with, um, especially in how you utilized... Um the cameras and stuff and as someone who i i read a lot and i'm a big fan of hp lovecraft and um edgar Allan poe and so, people like that and that yes piece of show don't tell um that kind of uh letting the audience see a little glimpse of the horror that um that the protagonist experienced without giving it all away was really really good we thought it was super <laughs> Well, I appreciate that. And so then our director of photography actually worked on the, this TV show. So he would, you know, his day job, all of us had these day jobs. And his day job was he would shoot this, like, daily sports um, talk show. Uh, I'm trying to think of, like, an because I lived in Northern Ireland um, for a number of years. I'm trying to think if there's, like, kind of an equivalent. Um, like, we, we have, like, a GAA thing. Like down here, where it's like a panel of people talking about like yeah. matches post match and stuff like that. Yeah, so it would be exactly like that in terms of like it's if you're if you're a director of photography or a cinematographer, it does not it's it's not taxing you, you know, like it's not it's not challenging you. Um, and but he had done a bunch of other stuff, and we were friends with him. And the really cool thing was, I think for all of us, we we're like, hey, we want to do something. We know we've got limitations in terms of our budget because we're going to have to self-fund this because we've never made anything before. What are the ways that we can do this? And he was like, listen, I've got a lot of, I've done a lot of favors for other friends of mine. I can borrow cameras. And 
the thing is though i don't know what type of camera i'm gonna get each day it's it could be different and so it was like okay that's awesome actually instead of us trying to so some days he would just have like the equivalent of a tv news camera and other days he would have something much nicer and some days it would be a canon and some days and our thing was like instead of trying to fake like we're going to shoot all of this fake like all this footage is from the same camera let's use the fact that we've got different cameras to our advantage right so like some days must have been crazy trying to get like the shots that you need with that specific camera that completely day, right completely yeah and so um, and, and we had talked about, you know, early on, we had talked about found footage, but we kind of wanted to do something a little bit different because we rec recognized with, with respect to a lot of folks, like people have done some incredible found footage stuff and we weren't, we wanted to not, we wanted to see if there was something different that we could do. And so we started talking about still photography and then somewhere along the lines, it was like, what if we did it kind of in the you know, Arizona area, because we could get access, you know, it's not super far away from where we were in Southern California. We could get there. We could kind of tie into some of the, um, tie in might not be the right phrasing. We could kind of speak to some of the issues that were, that were happening along the, right. the so United States. That kind of plot line of, um, of like the, um, the immigration and people crossing the border, that was more of an organic thing that happened rather than something that like, that you set out originally to talk about or or was it was that kind of the idea initially or was it just something with location and it kind of spurred the moment thing no it was it, it's a good question it was something from the from the outset it was like okay this is the thing that we're going to do um it's going to have this you know so a, a, truthfully a lot of what is on the screen like that is pretty much what we set out to do right. now it it got bigger because one of the things we used to talk about is like, man, we're going to shoot this in like 10 days and we're going to do it in like two locations and we're going to be done. And we ended up shooting in five different states, two different countries. We shot over the course of maybe eight months. Now it would be, okay, we're all free this Saturday or we're all, you know, two of us are free Monday night. Or it was like whenever we could get it and whenever we could get when we needed actors too. Um, the other thing that our director of photography was able to connect us with was a town in a really small town in Utah, uh, in the United States. And he had a buddy who had shot there in the past and like, it was like, everyone here is really cool. So Turner, who's the director of photography and I went to Green River, Utah, which is, it's really, I think it's, it's most famous because it is like one of the last stopping points before you in Utah, before you get to Moab. So. I don't know if you've seen the film uh, 127 Hours, but it's yeah. this town is referenced there because it's kind of your last stop before there, before you get to Moab. Okay. Um, and we just had the run of the town. Like, That's awesome. So, so it, did you guys like get any permission to shoot or were you just kind of rogue filmmaking it, like just going out and just doing what you could every day where you were? The permission was Turner was a friend of this. His friend Gary was friends with a bunch of people in the town, and Gary had purchased an old hotel, and it looks exactly like you would expect an old hotel from like the eighteen hundreds to look. And he was renovating it, kind of Victorian, but he kind of rundown. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And now it was the renovations were partially done, so Turner and I were sleeping on the floor of this place. And it's like pitch black and it's old and it's like, I'm not going to say it's haunted, but d we didn't sleep well. Let's put it that way. Yeah. Um, I think it's been much, it, the, the renovations are finished now, but it's not a bad place to be when you're making a horror movie. Totally. It was, it was very uh, emotionally appropriate for the whole vibe. Um, but yes, yeah, so turn, so essentially Turner led us to his friend Gary and then Gary led us to a couple of key people in the town who were just like, Okay, yeah, you guys are cool. Like, if you if Gary likes you, then you're good with us. And so, we would be shooting in the middle of the night out in the street, um, and like a police car would drive by, and you know, not a police car, the police car in the town would drive by, and the guy would be like, "All right, good job, guys, keep going," you know. Um, and we stay, you know, we we rounded up, you know, sometimes forty or fifty people from the town because um, folks were just like. They were down for it, and they were really up for anything that that 
we wanted to do. Um, and so people brought their own wardrobe sometimes, and sometimes they just showed up in whatever they were wearing. But um, that was a really... All of the characters from the population of that town? Or were, were there also people that you knew? Or did you just kind of get people as they came? Yeah, so uh, um, it, uh, great question. It's a mix of all of the above. So there were a lot of folks from Green River, Utah, um, and they would bring friends and stuff like that. And then there were folks that we actually did do casting calls for. Um, and then there were some friends as well who were like, hey, we kind of wrote this part for you. Would you be interested in being in it? Um, and, and one of the things that it, just from a pure production standpoint that we really took away from it was um and i don't I, I you know i don't know where you are in terms of like you know filmmaking and and one of the things but like i think a lot of people the feedback that we got was from pe from actors who were in it or from people who sort of worked on the crew with us was yeah we'll do more like what, what this is fun what else do you need and somebody at one point one of the actors who we had auditioned and we ended up casting for a different part he he emailed back and he said, yeah, I'd love to do it. Like, you guys were really nice and you were polite and like you respond, you sent me a follow up email after the audition, which like nobody does. So he's like, so time and time again, I go and I audition for gigs and I just never hear anything. Yeah. And he's like, just being nice. He's like, I just felt so good and like felt so supported. And so we were really struck by how much further you can, I mean, you know, like, you, like they say, how much further you can go with a kind word. Um, yeah. And people were just like, yeah, actually, you know what? I've got this like busted up old truck in my backyard. Like, do you want me to like push that out here? Use it. Yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> yeah, like it, so it became bigger than what we had initially imagined just because people dug what we were doing. And I think honestly, just because we weren't jerks about it. And, and did you guys... <laughs> I noticed uh, my main thing about it was I am really into the mockumentary stuff, especially when it's like horror mock mockumentaries. And yep. I'm watching um, Lake Mungo, which I don't know if you've seen it. It's an Australian horror movie. Um, yes. Which follows this family grieving their um, their dead daughter, but is she dead? And there's like time travel and stuff in it. Very, very yep. good film. But um, I actually thought watching, and I'm not even like trying to toot your horn. I just, I really, really <laughs> enjoyed uh, Savage Land. I thought Savage Land was a really, really good um, mockumentary because it's something that if you showed it, and I actually showed it to my girlfriend and I convinced her it was like um, a Netflix original mockumentary, like um, like documentary, sorry, like um, Making a Murder or something. And I put it on and she believed it up until the point where the picture of the little girl is at the buyers and the zombies are behind her. So she, yep. you guys did a great job at like, the believability of it, which I think is like a huge thing in horror, because you can watch a horror yeah. movie and you can be scared for the protagonist, um, but there's all there's always this fantastical element that separates you from it. But when it's believable, yeah. it's so much more effective. Like the idea that this is just, it's not even that he was a hero or anything like that. He was just somebody who happened to survive. Right. Well, no, I appreciate you saying that. And and one of the things that we kept talking about from a production standpoint and from a, from a believability standpoint was we wanted this to be something that theoretically, if if you were cha if you were watching TV and you were changing channels and you came into this a couple minutes late, you would think was real. You could pick it up, yeah, yeah, that you could pick it up immediately, but you'd be like, wait, I don't, I didn't see this in like you know, in TV Guide or in the listings, but like, holy crap, do you, like, do you guys know about this? Oh, um, no, we, we got really? that completely, like, when we, um, we were watching, like, a we were doing, like, test, almost test screenings, uh, me and my friend, for kind of horror movies that we wanted to add to, like, our bucket list and stuff like that, and little known horror movies, and we came across Savage Land, and, um, we, I think we watched it three or four times <laughs> in the one day, because awesome. we were just, blown away and it's not even that i guess like the movie is very very competently made and put together and it's just it's a very good story but it's also that it's it's a very inspiring um film to exist because when we looked it up like they're like as as you're saying like a lot of it is kind of just like right place right time like it just you know n you didn't have a ton of money to throw at it it was just kind of um a work of passion almost which which shows a lot in the film itself
No, I appreciate that. And, and yeah, it really was. And there wasn't much money in it. Like we like truthfully have always kind of exaggerated the budget a little bit because it's so small that we, we want it to be taken seriously. Yeah. So we didn't want to be now, even the exaggerated number is not, you know, the, the exaggerated number is not very high. It is definitely a micro budget movie, but a lot of what it was, was it was calling in favors and it was asking for help. And, but the other thing was, and some of this, it's funny just how technology has changed. So for example, um, a lot of the overhead shots are, um, so uh, I wasn't actually able to attend the the shoot on this one particular day, but uh, the DP and the other two co-directors went to Palm Springs and went in a, you know, like a, you can hire like a tourist helicopter. And they did that, but put GoPros, you know, on the, um, in a couple of different spots on the helicopter. And then also our DP shot out, filmed out of the helicopter. So instead of going the traditional, I'm probably revealing some some secrets here. Maybe I shouldn't, but instead of going the traditional way of hiring an actual helicopter for the shoot, it was like, no, let's, we can actually kind of do this in a different way. Now, obviously with drones and how far that's come, come since we, we made the movie, you, you don't even have to worry about it. Yeah. Um, but there were a lot of things of like, hey, what if we just did this? And truthfully, there is, there's some stuff that was shot where... Um, because of the cameras that we had on a given day, it looked more like a still camera. So when you're just kind of walking around with a still camera, people don't really think much about it. Um, whereas if you show up with a big crew and you've got lights and you've got all that, there's a little bit more of a te- more attention paid. Like, hey, do you have permits for this? But if you're just walking around with like a you know regular what looks like a regular Canon um, still camera, nobody's nobody really bats an eye. That's, that's um, it's a cool part of the movie too, how you can notice that. Um... A lot of the footage seems like a documentary crew picking up the story and getting footage off of as many people as possible because of that, you know? Like, a lot of it feels like people that were around at the time just, like, sent them footage or they acquired footage from people. It wasn't all shot by them, which is, like, it really adds to that aspect of um, there being a lot of different takes on it, which is a huge thing with the characters in the movie. I mean, like, and I really like that aspect of there's the truth of what happened, which is kind of given to the viewer as the movie goes on. Like, um, I believe it's Salazar is the, yep. um, there's kind of what actually happened, which there was this kind of outbreak of Romero-esque zombies that came came in and, you know, flushed out the town and killed everyone. And then yes. kind of these different theories, like you've got the, um, I forgot if he was the mayor or the sheriff, and he's kind of like saying that Salazar is, you know, he's bad, he's the serial killer, and then there's that guy that's kind of, only focusing on the other angle of it where they're just trying to put him away because he's um because he's an immigrant and whatnot and then you have this kind of truth to it all where none of that actually matters you know like like that's not that's that's not the actual kernel of what happened in this town and it's a really yes. cool thing because i feel like that happens a lot of the time i mean if you watch making a murder like and all of those kind of documentaries that talk about stuff like this where nobody yes. really knows what happens there's always that kind of personal biasy that comes with these people who are really into it. And yes. it always bleeds into kind of the truth. And then it kind of gets murky and murkier and murkier as it goes on and on. Yeah, I agree. And it's, it, that's exactly what we were sort of going for. And that idea of like, trying to be careful with it at the same time, because if you push it too far and if the, say the sheriff you know, becomes too much of like a cartoon villain figure, or if the, you know, the public defender seems t- way too incompetent. Like if it, it trying to keep things within a certain range of believability, so that if it if it doesn't go too if it goes too far, and to your point from earlier, like if it breaks at a certain moment, then the whole thing's broken. Oh yeah, you know. I mean, I if you, like, I I felt that a lot with um. I don't know if you've seen the new Blair Blair Witch movie, the one. Uh, yes. I felt like that whole thing of, um, and now it's, it, there's a lot of cool, like, creature design in it, and the sound design is phenomenal, but when it comes to, like, how that movie operates narratively, there's, like, a lot of stuff where the suspension of disbelief and that kind of thing that the original had, where, I mean, people saw the original at a film festival and they thought it was real. That was what was scary about it, right, at the time. People were like, oh, these kids went missing in the woods because they had all this, um, 
kind of rogue um, promotion for it where they had like missing posters for the kids and stuff. And they were like, oh my God. But in this yep. one, in the new one, it, you lost that kind of magic that made it, you know, made the original so poignant. And it's, it's yes. one thing that I found in Savage Land and it's one of the kind of found footage mockumentary movies that I always point to if people are looking for stuff like that in horror. That and uh, I don't know if you've seen The Bay. It's kind of like a yeah. yep. horror thing. That, yes. The, the, those two movies are the ones that I'm, I'm always like, look, if you want to like make them and you want to see like a masterclass on how to do it, this is how you do it. Because it's just like, because you, as you said, you can put someone in front of it and if they're halfway through, they can go, oh my God, I can't believe that this happened. And I wonder if it was a cult or if it was the cartel or what happened, yep. here, you know? Yeah. And, and that notion of like, wait, why didn't, why didn't more people talk about this? Like we needed to, you know, how come this is so, yeah. And it's, I, I, you know, I appreciate the, uh, sort of being grouped into the same category as the Bay, which is a movie that we, we saw after making this truthfully. Um, but I have a great deal of respect for, um, yeah, it was that, that, cause I, I think truthfully, to be honest, there, there was an, I just said truthfully, to be honest, which is a, quite a combination um there was a little bit of concern on our part because for example Blair Witch had done the original Blair Witch had done it so well yeah. that like could that still be done and and Cloverfield had done you know a, a version of found footage really well you know like there have been there had been examples that were done really well and it's like at what point is there a point at which the audience is kind of like we don't buy it anymore. Like we just kind of, know. cause there's always that stuff of like, you know, well, that's pretty convenient that the person dropped the camera and they managed to still get the, you know, perfectly framed up shot of what they, you know, yeah. Yeah. so we were always trying to be really careful about stuff like that from a production standpoint that did not seem like, Oh, that's mighty convenient. Um, and, and trying to check ourselves on that a little bit. Did you guys, um, I meant to ask you as well, what I found super interesting was, um, there's actually a, Imager, I don't know if you've heard of it. It's like a image hosting site. Um, yeah. Yep. Like a compilation of all of the um, stills from the movie of all of the Salazar's um, camera, all of the. Oh really? Yeah, yeah. yeah. There's like all of them are put out into a thing. I, I'll send it to you later. It's super cool to yeah, watch, look at them all one by one. But uh, how did you guys get the effects for that? Like, how did you get the glowing eyes and stuff? Was it post? Was it like post processing, or did you just kind of have? tricks of the light on the day with the camera and stuff like that so it was a mix some of which some of it was genuinely um shooting with you know an old school camera and kind of messing with it um either keeping the you know either messing with the film beforehand mess, or sorry messing with the film afterwards or messing with the actual camera itself and some of it was um photoshop um but none of us are great you know so i guess technically that's an you know post-production but like none of us it was not like we sent these photos off to a house yeah. um you know a post-production house i'm actually i'm actually in one of them uh, actually i'm in a couple of them and we're we're all in some of them but I, one of them it was just it's perfectly done i'm actually inside a house um i think there's a i think there's a shot of some of these entities outside a house looking looking at a window that is lit and i'm actually inside and i was giving instruction i was directing the actor or actress who was inside but our dp took photos and like that ended up being creepier um yeah. because i'm not because i'm not paying any attention to what's going on outside because i didn't think we were doing anything um so it, it's a combination of actual photos that we kind of messed with intentionally from a technical standpoint uh and then you know some some photoshop stuff as well yeah and speaking to that like i always find with good narratives there's micro and macro stories so there's like the micro story of like did the little girl survive you know like like that's kind of a thing that goes on like the friendship that salazar had with this girl and then like what happened to her and you're kind of wondering and then you find out it's very bleak but um and then there's also the um, the priest, and you hear the recording uh, of the priest, and there's kind of these micro stories that are yep. filling in like the people of the town and how this affected them, and yes, you know, and I always find that that's super like it really fleshed it out for me when it wasn't just 
Salazar going through this town and seeing the destruction and like what kind of a Night of the Living Dead, Dawn of the Dead outbreak would look like from just somebody who wasn't being followed by a film crew, you know? Yeah. Like somebody was just yeah. on the ground floor. And it's just, it was really, it was a really harrowing, uh, ha sorry, my bad, um, harrowing moment to um, listen to, um, listen to that recording of, and I believe it was, I, I don't remember if he killed his family or not because he didn't want them to, he mercy killed them. I forget what exactly happened, but the priest was... Yeah. On the recording, he was like, oh, you know, God is good. We've been forsaken and all this stuff. And it really reminded me. And I don't know. I, I assume you guys were inspired by Romero a little bit because that kind of reminded me of the when the dead, when there's no more room in hell, the dead will walk the earth yeah. and that kind of really hard hitting stuff. Yes, definitely. Uh, that is something very much that we were in inspired by. And we we had sort of more references to Romero in it that we ultimately pulled out a little bit because we thought, you know what, that's actually going to make it seem a little bit too... On the nose. Uh, yeah, too on the nose. And we didn't want to be quite so, so much on the nose, but we did want to make sure that we were sort of, you know, tipping our caps to sort of the founder of the genre. Um, now, and, and, and it's funny you mentioned about the stories because that was something from early on that we had talked about because it's like, we kind of wanted it to not be just um, a body count movie. And like these were, you know, adding to the realism of the experience that these were real people. And here are some of the, you know, survivors or relatives not here, not, you know, like we're not, you're not going to hear from the survivors with the exception of Salazar, but here are relatives of people who lost someone that, that night. Um, Did you guys and that was something about doing, um, doing another one from an, an, an another perspective of somebody who didn't make it out or more information being found or do you think that it's just better off how it is because i i'd love to see more but like it's it's also a thing where i think um you want to leave the audience wanting more in the end that's kind of the that's kind of your your main goal yeah it's it, that's a great question it's a question that we've talked about a lot on on our end because after we made it, we, there were a bunch of different people, both sort of within the industry and just sort of like friends and family who were like, you guys got to make another one. And we were kind of like, I, you know, we don't know if we want to sort of like, does it, does it ruin it or does it enhance it to do something else? Um, it's, it's, it's also like you could, you could end up like Wreck, where they made probably one of the best horror movies of all time. And then yeah. the sequels slowly peter out because there's nowhere to go because the, the, you lose that initial kind of what's going on kind of thing. But the thing totally. that's good about Savage Land is even by the end of the film, you even when you know that for sure Salazar is, was a victim of a zombie outbreak and whatnot, or these kind of creatures, um, there's still that whole mystery surrounding why it happened, where they came from, where did they go? That was a huge thing that creeped me out. Like afterwards, there's like, this whole town of zombies that's just gone. Like, nobody knows where they went. Yes, and so that was something that would, had always really interested us, and it was like, well, maybe we would do something. So we do have, we do have an idea that we've been kicking around recently, because we've also we've gone on individually to do other stuff, um, mostly in, in television. Um, but, yeah, we've kind of... I think, I, so we've been kicking around, there's an idea that we have that we've been kicking around and it's like, this might be a thing to do. I think truthfully, we've been, I, I can put my hand on my heart and say like the the response and the feedback that we've had over the X number of years is beyond our wildest dreams, genuinely. Yeah. Um, when it came out, it's funny because I think the release date is listed as 2015. It didn't actually come out until 2017. I think 2015, we may have submitted to a film festival. But on IMDb, you can't, once that date is there, you can't delete, you can change anything else, but for whatever reason, you can't change that date. I was um, thinking about that, because I didn't see it until last year, but on IMDb, it said it came out in 2015, but all of the, um, all of the places where you can watch it uploaded it kind of 2018, 2019. So it's like, wh wh where was it originally released was like a big thing in my brain. I was like, was it a DVD thing or did you guys get it played in theaters or no, so we didn't do a theater. So we we had a premiere at the like the first public premiere was at uh, Comic Con in San Diego. They have a film festival, and so 
it was there and that was really cool because um Len Wein, who is, um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with him, he's um, no longer with us, but he was the um, one of the creators of Wolverine. Um, and he's in the movie. He's a friend of somebody else who is, is a great example of, we cast a guy who was awesome, the guy who plays um, the radio host, and um, we really liked him. He's like, you know what, I've got a buddy who, like, would really like to be in a movie. Like, do you guys want me to talk to him? We were like, sure. Not knowing anything. And and it turned out his buddy is this sort of legendary comic book figure, Len Wein. Um, and so Len is in, ultimately is in the movie, went and shot at his house. And for one of, for Simon, who was one of the co-directors, this was like, you know, meeting Elvis. Like, this was the greatest, the, the greatest thing that could happen and it was just an awesome experience for all of us and we shot at len's house and so len is the um photography expert um who's like yeah no these are real photographs um so that was a lot of fun and so then when we were at the screening and at comic-con obviously there are a lot of people at, at comic-con who know who len is uh so that was a that was that was pretty cool um but then we didn't it it wasn't ultimately um it was distributed to like Amazon Prime um, and all online platforms, there are now DVDs available. But originally, it was all uh, it was all um, streaming. Um, but now DVDs are available for purchase. Cool, that's awesome. Um, I I was also like curious about the um, about like how the script was written because all of the dialogue from a lot of the um, interviewees who are being asked about kind of their take on on these people are kind of like the um the guy who was kind of like the at home detective putting putting together the case and that kind of stuff um i always wondered if some of that was ad libbed or if it was all written like written down like there was no changes in um in shooting between what was written on the page and what was said so um but a long way of answering that question is the i had mentioned earlier this friend gary who um had the connection to this town in utah and so we're out in utah we're shooting and there's there are like one or two restaurants in town and, and we're all having dinner at this restaurant it's a burger place and gary is with us and gary's like okay so walk me through this you guys don't really have a script you're not shooting in sequential order you're just kind of shooting stuff when you get cameras and when you can get locations and we're like yep and he's like, oh my gosh, your editors are going to have, like, they're going to die. <laughs> um, and, and so, yeah, so it's a long way of saying we had, it, we had an outline. And then we, what we would do is we would come to each shoot. And in some cases, it was pretty scripted. And in other cases, we would have bullet points that we wanted to make sure they hit. Sometimes right down to the fact that we would have a whiteboard. Somebody behind the camera would have a whiteboard. Um, and would write a key point. Like, as long as you can say whatever you want, whatever feels authentic and real to you, but make sure you say this at the end of it. Um, and so that's how we, that's how we wanted to work, because most of the folks in it are not professional actors um, and actresses. So we wanted them to feel as comfortable as possible and to be as natural as possible so that they weren't focusing on making sure that they, they hit a, every right word in the dialogue, but more make sure you get the right, you know, the right vibe, the right feeling, the right emotion. And if there is something really specific that we need said, we'll point it out to you. It's crazy to me because it's like a lot of the movies hire, from from my opinion, from me watching it was the um, the family that Salazar was friends with. And like, <laughs> my big thing for me was like, even though you don't hear a lot from them and you just kind of hear what they were like and you see pictures of of the little girl and I think she's in, in the school at the time and she's trapped and there's all these eyes behind her like lighting up. Um, yep. You get this kind of feeling of like, of the same kind of loss he did and there's a lot of like heart there and there's a lot of, there's also a lot of like really cool stuff to be said about like, um, how, how could I word it? Like, um, Salazar's uh, point of view, even though all we really get out of him is when he's being interviewed and stuff like that, you really feel what he felt as he's going through the pictures. And did you guys like 
think about that like were you trying to like tell a co- like a cohesive story true to pictures or was it more of a thing where once you had them all shot you kind of used them when when you could to kind of further along the narrative no we were trying to tell a, a, a cohesive story um and the person who actually played Salazar is a photographer, actually, um, and an artist. Um, and he was a friend of uh, the wife of one of the co-directors. And I don't think he'd ever done any acting before in his life. But she had said, yeah, I think this guy might be kind of the guy for you. And we met with him and he was really cool. And then like when we shot and it was, yeah, like him going through it and him talking. And like we felt... Um, both um, honored by by how he you know played the character, but also it, he made himself very vulnerable, and he that that added a level of realism that was really was really hard to quantify. Um, and I think the whole thing wouldn't work without without him and without his performance and just uh, the, the vulnerability that he was um, that he shared. And and did you guys like when you were thinking about Salazar as a character, and I, I suppose an aspect of him as well, you can't fully know him or like you know how like movie, movie protagonists in general is, like the main goal is he has to be at least likable or at least fun to follow, but you guys can yes kind of keep a little bit of a step back from him because the whole mystery surrounding him is kind of the driving point right like that's that's what the documentary and the kind of meta narrative in this universe is it's like who is Sal- like is he telling the truth and what is the truth behind yes experience yeah and that's a gr- that's a, a really great point and something that uh, that's cool that you picked up on that because something we we did want if he's too believable like if you're too close to him and too sort of as an audience too intimate with him you're gonna believe him regardless and we wanted to create a still maintain a level of doubt um because we felt like that might that might be fun and that might r- really add to what we're doing right yeah because it's it's just like from watching it um you really get the feeling that especially in the um interviews when he's talking i think he's talking to a therapist or he's talking to some sort of a counselor yes um, yep you get the feeling that he's not even really there and that could also be because he was infected i believe um he got bit but uh um, yep so he's also dealing with that and a thing that I was always curious about, did Salazar as a character in kind of the meta narrative know that that was how it transmitted or was he just like, oh, I'm wounded and he didn't know that he was going to become one of them? For for us, he didn't know. Okay. Um, yeah, that, that was our that was our thinking was it was not this knowledge of, oh, okay. It, it, because I think we sort of felt like there's sometimes in... in we tried to, it sounds sort of crazy to say, but like we tried to think about it in terms like if this really happened, and I think sometimes in movies, people, characters understand sort of the rules of the game faster than they should. Yeah. Yeah, than they should. And then we would in real life. Because it's like, think about this. This has been a totally chaotic night. He's probably not putting together, like, wait a second. This then this, you know. Probably in shock and like ridden yeah. PTSD and stuff too. There's all this other stuff that never really gets. To, yeah, to your point, PTSD and shock and all this other stuff because there's so much to process. And sometimes we sort of felt like sometimes characters know too much too fast. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Kind of the. We didn't want him to do. That. It's a it's a big thing that got me with um, like movies. A lot of the kind of newer zombie movies tend to do it way too quick where it's like oh zombies already exist in this universe or whatever and they know that bites transmit but it's kind of like it does break it a little bit and usually they'll have that moment where someone's bit and then they'll turn and then they put two and two together but i like it is a thing and you're you're absolutely right where a person who's experiencing this and barely surviving and trying to just document as much as they can so that you know so that they can figure out what's going on isn't thinking about what the, like how it transmits or what it is they're probably like this is this is probably an act of like the devil this <laughs> is right. and and also we were really careful not to use the word zombie at any point because there is this like we wanted that level of authenticity because 
in quote unquote real life, if you said, hey, I got bitten by a zombie, people would be like, what are you talking? Like, that doesn't make any sense. But in zombie movies, there's this like, oh, it's an under Oh, these zombies, you know? So we wanted to have more of a feeling of like, I'm not going to, I'm not going to say what I think it is because you're going to think I'm crazy. And if I say what I think. Did, did you ever set like, is it a thing where they were zombies or was it a thing where they were kind of ghouls or kind of like night of the living dead-esque zombies where they're kind of still able to like pick up tools and use them and stuff or you know we we had a lot of conversations about what they are um and sort of where they would fall in the pantheon of you know and what what would be the best descriptors um and then we kind of were like okay we're gonna make the, we're gonna have some internal rules for ourselves about what they are so that it's consistent throughout the throughout the film and then we'll just leave it at that. Okay. So you guys had like a, you guys had a rule book to follow on how these creatures like acted and and what did yeah I mean, how they moved and what they looked like and you know was there any level could they communicate with each other and what were they trying to do like what was the goal? Um, what I genuinely loved from the pictures was a lot of the pictures from them seem. Like, because usually if you took a picture of a zombie, like in 28 Days Later or Zombie Line or something, they'd look like a person that's decaying, kind of, or The Walking Dead and whatnot. But a lot of the yep. pictures of them looked more like, really reminded me of that kind of George A. Romero ghoul, like kind of this almost demonic. It actually reminded me of the Deadites from Evil Dead a lot. That kind of yep. Yep. warped, warped, not infected, but warped, like, image of it. Like, it's a humanoid, but it's been, like, warped by something that's just evil. Yes, and that was that was both Evil Dead and and all things Romero were definitely um, touchstones for us. Yeah, well, it's yeah. Um, I think we're gonna wrap it up um, around in in maybe five or six minutes. But if there's anything that you want to, um, we don't have that big of an audience. But if there's anything that you're working on right now that you want to talk about or you want to get out there, um, we'd be more than happy to. No, I, I I appreciate it. Um, you know, and I if you've got more if if there are more questions, I, I'm I'm in no rush. Uh, this is this has been a really fun conversation. We are, de we, yeah. So as I kind of alluded to earlier, we are developing something, and the you know at the moment, um, and there is a there is a you know there's a fun I guess there's kind of a fun challenge that we that we that we find ourselves facing, which is we made this movie that that seem to resonate with folks and we're really conscious of that and we don't want to ruin it um but at the same time like there were fun things and we'd like to get we'd like to sort of there were fun things that were fun to explore and we didn't feel like we fully explored it um and so we might be sort of returning to that uh, at some point if you are up for another question i'd i'd love to ask you uh, the um the whole uh, kind of meta narrative of it, or, or kind of the the narrative that uh, the whole um, immigration thing and kind of people coming over yeah. the border and stuff was that like a big nod to Romero, or was that just something that you guys want to tell? Because Romero touched on that a lot with like, um, especially in Night of the Living Dead and Dawn of the Dead, that kind of like commentaries on society's true horror. Yeah, that was definitely that 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 was definitely something that was really on our mind um and the notion of the sort of the uh, the ability to vilify um people who are different um I, I, I mean the over the the trite way of saying it that sounds sort of pompous and cliche is you know sort of man's inhumanity to man is the real horror but which sounds, you know, absurd, but I think there is actually, I think that's the beauty of Romero's work, yeah. um, or one part of the beauty of his work. And it's, it's a thing is, in all zombie narratives, the kind of, Walking Dead did it a lot of the, you don't need to be afraid of the dead, you need to be afraid of the living and stuff like that, you know? It's a big yes, thing. Yes, exactly. like and, 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 and what was interesting about, as we were making it, that was a big issue and then in the in in the united states and in the southwest in particular and then it kind of faded away um and then it came back again and it it continues you know th there is a um there's a really strong vilification um of people who are different and people who are um 
there's a presumption and a, a level of rage and anger that's directed yeah. at folks and we um wanted to raise that and sort of uh talk about that but not do it, it we tried not to be heavy-handed about it as well and it's a thing that um is calm it's kind of it intertwines with salazar's kind of like his style of photography and what he takes pictures of because the photographer says like oh this stuff is like like there's a lot of cool like underlying meaning here and he has a great eye and stuff like that but other people see him and they're like oh he's taking pictures of roadkill and children he must be a yeah. maniac like that's that's how they're going to paint him yes and that yeah i i'm i'm glad that resonated with you because that was exactly that was that was where we wanted to sort of like before all of this that vilification and that caricature was happening and, and the, the kind of, we wanted to sort of weave that in and did the role of like disinformation or kind of kind of people's biases getting caught up in their decision making around kind of what happened and, and around how to treat salazar did was that more of a thing of um we're gonna kind of get all these talking points but we're gonna point out the flaws in both sides because i noticed that a lot where there were characters that even though that they were on the right path to kind of like being good or being on the right side they still had their own personal biases that got mixed up in it and they had these kind of theories that even though there was evidence to disprove what they were saying it only benefited them you know what i mean like there was um, yeah. the, the mayor or the sheriff was just put them away let's just get get rid of it i want it to be gone and then the guy yep. um i forget his name he uh he was kind of the at home kind of like piece yep. together journalist guy he was kind of like oh well it's it's all to do with like you know um race and like who he was and and it's like well at the core of it he's just a guy who was in this horrible situation <laughs> yes kind of overlooked. Uh, yeah because we didn't want it to be we didn't want to fall into too too much of a very clear we wanted it to be kind of i think to maybe reference something that you'd said earlier sort of murky or muddy and not not totally clear and so i think sometimes it, it can be really tempting to be like okay we're just gonna make the, you know the the following people they're right and the following people are wrong you know this group of people are right and this group of people are wrong and we didn't feel like from a from a dramatic standpoint from a, an entertainment standpoint or attention standpoint we wanted there to be a little bit of like is it totally i don't know you know we wanted people to be kind of hemming and hawing throughout to just sort of like and, and without being 100 did you uh, a thing that really got and a thing that i thought was really cool the photographer character was talking all the time about um how when he was behind the camera he was invincible you know he had that kind of thing where he was untouchable and then when he reaches out his hand I always wonder if that's when he got bitten. If that's when, if when he finally interacted with the people and tried to save somebody, that's when his hand got snatched or something, and that's when he was marked to die by the bite. Yeah, yeah, um, I, you nailed it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, we. Uh, yes. Yeah, I, I, I've seen. Uh, we, we thoroughly looked through it. It's, it's a really, really good that's, piece. Um, that's awesome. That was definitely what. Uh, that's that's what we had in mind. Yeah, and and did you guys um. Did you guys ever um, like consider, like, is there an in-universe rule for why they all disappeared or where they went or like what happened to them, or is it more of just a thing where there's just that mystery there? Yeah, we we kind of left it as the mystery because there was we wanted to be able to sort of um, give ourselves a little bit of space if we wanted to do something else. Um, but I but I I also really liked and we all also really liked the idea of like. This thing is happening. Whatever it is, it's happening and it's coming for everyone. And, you know, so in a way, sometimes it's kind of corny in a, in a, in a movie or, you know, like when you see the like, and we sort of used it a little bit with the AutoCAD of the town of like the dot here and dot there, and then they start to fill up the screen. Um, but and and you know that's a sort of a trope that's been used countless times in um, movies of this genre, and I still I love it. I just love the idea of like it starts off with one thing, and then it's another, and then it's another, and then it's no effect of, of yeah, yeah. That's and exactly. that was our, that was our feeling of like, and it's all coming, you know, as he's mapped it out, like it's all going north. And um, 
and the uh i i was just really um taken aback by um I, I was actually looking at the pictures last night preparing for this and there's this one picture where i think it's is it outside of a house or something like that and in the bushes you can see all of these faces just like this yeah. kind of and they're kind of this amalgamation and it really and i said this earlier but i think it's a it's a good point is it really reminded me of um reading hp lovecraft and reading things like that where because when we started it up it we we were under the impression it was a zombie movie and that's what we were going in for and then we were kind of like afterwards we were like well were they like like they must have been otherworldly in some aspect because there was that great fear of the unknown thing which i think a lot of horror movies miss nowadays because a lot of horror movies nowadays explain their the enemy too much they they let you know what yep. they're about but the, the fear and and as you said like it's coming for everyone but it's like it's coming from everyone you don't know what's coming for everyone even the right. viewer yeah. doesn't know what's coming well yeah and so our, some of our early stuff we like we love that that photo and that shot and that when like there's the like the reveal that the eyes are in the bushes um we love that and i i still to, that that was one that we shot in utah and i still remember to this day the actor who was the one who was there you know uh one particular actor who was in the bushes and i don't know if you've ever seen the film uh blow up no i haven't it's uh it's i think it's um antonioni it's gonna make me sound like such a pretentious film school like nerd worry, uh, good company. <laughs> so so it's antonioni and it's it's fun uh, and it's a really, it's a really nice, not nice. It's a, it's a great movie from the the mid '60s, but and the gist of it is a photographer is out and he's taking photographs, and then he realizes, wait, there's something on this photograph that I didn't expect to see. Um, and for us, that was one of the other touchstone pictures. It was like if we're doing still photographs, we probably should we we should reference or be, you know just sort of be mindful of. Of blow up in Antonioni, and so actually early on we had more shots, more still photos like that, but that kind of had that like slow reveal of like, wait, there's something here. But it felt like from a, it felt like we were hitting that note too many times, right. um, and we didn't want to keep going down, you know, because like after a while, after you've seen like two, it's like okay, you know, yeah. we get it. Every time there's a photo, that's something that, so we wanted to kind of advanced from that but we um we just really enjoyed the experience and and it's a really fun thing and there's i'm sure you've had in your own filmmaking experience when you have an idea in your head and then you execute it and then you see it on screen and you're like yeah that's yeah that was the idea i mean for for i i'm mainly a writer but i i do do a little bit of directing stuff just like little movies and stuff like that like nothing like just kind of one shot things that are six seven minutes yeah. long but it is a thing where, um, especially from like a narrative point of view, because um, that's mainly what I study is like construction and narrative and stuff like that. Um, yeah. What I find great about film and a lot of people in kind of my field would say that books are better at it. But I have a very strong argument for movies where if you have a film that has its script being kind of like the driving force kind of like the thing that's paving the road and then the film and the visuals being the thing that fleshes it out that's when yep. things kind of come together because there's a i don't know if you've ever seen exorcist tree legion the it was originally its own movie but it was actually written by a, a writer who did a book called legion and they were like do you want to make an exorcist movie but we'll just base it off your book and it's a good really really good story but it makes for a really bad movie because it's okay. he's, he's, he's a writer making a movie and that's kind of what I really liked about Savage Land and mockum and mock the genre in general is that there's this great thing with mockumentaries where you can frame a lot of the script in reality and you can build around that and really flesh it out. Yes, I, I agree. And I would say, and, and my sense would be that you've probably had similar experiences just even in some of the stuff that you're mentioning, just even if it's just a short film or just a one shot as much as I learned in grad school, in the two years I was in grad school, and I learned a ton, and it was worth every penny, we we have learned that same amount making this, if not more. Um, be, be, 
Yeah, it's a boots on the ground thing. It is a, you know, it's a recognition of like, okay, well, what sounds good, like in your head, like you can't really execute or, oh, this is really why you need to have tension in every scene, because otherwise it's just kind of two people standing in a room doing nothing, you know, like that type of a that type of a thing, it was really, it, it was a great experience from that standpoint. And I think, um, I think it made us better writers having, having made the film, um, and, uh, and, and continues to. What, um, what my friend wanted to ask, he sadly you couldn't come on. He has, he's currently sick in bed, but his whole thing was, um, he was really impressed with the kind of when it, when it flashes on screen and when it starts, there's this whole kind of thing where, it feels like a documentary that you'd see on the BBC or on RTE or like on these kind of broadcast stations. That's a true story that happened, you know, those true crime documentaries. And it yes. really just kind of sucks you in. And did you guys watch a lot of like TV document or like documentaries leading up to it kind of get that sense of how they're constructed? So we, we had seen, I don't know if you, uh, if you get it in Ireland, uh, there's a long running, a uh, couple of long running TV shows here in the United States. Uh, Dateline is one oh, yeah, of them. Yeah, yeah. yeah, we have primetime is what it's called here, but it's the same yeah. concept. Yeah. And so we, that was one of the models for us. Um, we got really lucky in one sense. So, so that was, that was, we were very like locked in on like, this is kind of how that, this is the format for those types of shows. Um, Making a Murderer was released by Netflix shortly before uh, our film was actually released. And, and that actually kind of helped because the opening credits for Making a Murderer and the opening credits for us, are, are there's a similarity. They're black and white, the, you know, sort of still photos and music. And I mean, listen, that's, that's not to say that black and white still photos and music is, you know, uh, that, that they invented that or that we invented that. I mean, obviously, that's been... Yeah, but you that's been utilized it so well. You know what I mean? Like it's, um, and and, yeah. and so that really that really helped. It's, you know, because making a murderer was instantly a huge hit, and so it helped. It almost no, we'd never we we had never seen it. We had no way of seeing it because they, they they genuinely came out within I think a few months of each other. But it looked like we had studied that and had followed and they did a you know masterful job with that it looked in a way if you watched making a murder and then you saw our film you would think oh wow they that's kind of the genre that they were working in and it's like, like it, it is but it's entirely a coincidence and we're really happy about that coincidence and i think it speaks to how you guys did it like where you can make that comparison because as i said earlier like there's you kind of have these micro sto stories going on that are kind of fleshed out as it goes of other people that were in the town the same thing happens in making a murder like other people giving their perspectives and like what people think and the thing that yep. kind of gets me about and a lot of people really like like mungo i don't think it's a bad movie at all it's just not it's uh in that kind of genre i don't think it's as good as people make it out to be i'm not like trying to crap on them. like it's a good movie and everything. No. but um, yeah no. i think where they failed where you guys succeeded is like mungo kind of has this thing where um it kind of drags a little bit because you're meant to be focused on this one this one particular story and there's nothing really fleshing it out it's just all pertaining to that whereas you guys had like in my opinion with savage land Sa salazar is more of a vessel for the main character which is the event is like is yeah the spectacle of it all yes totally and and that's if we that's sort of what we were that was our thought process was if we were making a documentary of this event how would we make that documentary? And we always sort of refer to it as like a fictional documentary. Um, and to shoot it like that and to really approach it from that standpoint, you know, and so that, that allows us to then cut away to interviews with the therapist or with um, the author or with the photography expert or, you know, um, yeah, that was, that was all uh, something that we really wanted to explore. And um, I... I'm I'm a huge like nut for kind of like religious horror or horror that involves that kind of thing. I don't know if you've heard of a game called Faith, the Unholy Trilogy. It came out recently. It's uh, oh no, it's really good. It's uh it's it's about a priest who's like exercising this kind of like house, and it's like an old school eight bit game, but they use rotoscoping to um, which is basically like a colorful outline of uh, visual images. 
to capture yep. demons and stuff. And it really reminded me of like how unique the presentation is with your creatures because I guess the thing that a lot of movies do they kind of misunderstand where Carpenter was coming from or where Geiger was coming from or any of these guys where there's kind of like, oh, well, the beast or the creature has to be kind of a spectacle of mm -hmm. effects and has to be really, really cool to look at. But like the thing about the thing or like those movies or Geiger's movies or any of those things is when you look at them, you can't tell what they are. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yep. You, you can't. They're that kind of eldritch kind of quality to them where you don't understand. The mist did it really well as well. And I think you guys really hit that nail on the head of um, being able to understand vaguely what they are while also having little to no idea what they're capable of, capable of or like how, how it works or anything. And um, I, I don't know if you read World War Z. Yes. Um, yep. We, when we saw it, we were like, this is like the best proof of concept. And we were actually saying, uh, we actually made a Reddit post about it and we said that you guys should be giving the, given the rights to World War Z and just being allowed to like make these like a mini series of like different mm -hmm. documentaries around it because it was it felt so much like a story that could fit into that narrative so easily it could just slip in. We we would we would love that we would be honored that that uh, and the fact that you're it's just saying that I really is making me smile. Um, Phil, who was I had mentioned earlier, who's one of the the, the other two co directors, um, he that was one of the first things that he referenced um, when we were just in the, in our initial conversations, we we're both uh, at work sort of sitting on couches because we had a little bit of time to kill. And that was one of the things that he had referenced uh, was world wars. So that's really cool that you guys uh, dug that as well. It genuinely just feels like something that's in that kind of, in that kind of universe. And I, and I guess another thing about it is like, um, it's, believable enough because world war z is written in a very believable way even though it's kind of fantastical um, yep the believe it like believability in horror at least for me there's like a huge they're always at war with each other and they both complement each other really well but when it comes together it really comes together and you can do it in yep. different ways like uh you guys are more grounded but like i think the reason that movies like alien work so well is um you don't even understand the technology of the time because it's so far in the future that all of these things the whole kind of environment is foreign and that's this kind of feel i mean at least for us because we're from ireland and we don't have any experience really with that we, we've read about it but we don't have any first-hand experience with that kind of american politics the whole thing felt like we were picking up just as much as somebody who from ireland who would be watching it if it was a real documentary which is really was really interesting that's really cool. No, I, I I really appreciate you saying that. Um, and I think you're right. I think that that tension, uh, in 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 horror films is always it's so it's so vital because it's like you you know people are coming along for the ride, but um it, it has to it has to work and it has to feel both real and also sort of not real at the same time. Yeah, yeah, and it, and. and so yeah, that was something that was on our minds throughout the process. It's, um, I actually, uh, did you see, um, I'm trying to figure out, I remember the name of it now. Um, is it Dead Stream or something like that? It's a new found footage yeah. movie that came out on Shudder, which I, re I really like it. It's, uh, I don't know if you've heard of it. It's kind of like a horror movies only platform. Um, yes, I'm very familiar with it. Yep. Yeah, it's great. Um, they have this, I, I think you'd like it a lot. It's about this kind of like, streamer who's been cancelled who goes he does these crazy stunts and he goes to stay in a haunted house has a lot of evil dead vibes but the believability there was the interactions between and you can understand that the guys who made it are probably people who grew up with that kind of twitch and uh, you know those kind of vod things where um, yep they knew the, how those interactions worked and they knew how streamers and these new e-celebrities thought yes and yep it's, it's it's a really really cool even though narratively and everything the movies are so different from each other it's a it's a really good conjoining point between them where um that factor of believability and that factor of um how can we make this so if somebody watches it at some point they're going to know it's a horror film but how can we watch it where the person will be like oh yeah like i've seen that happen before on twitch or i've seen that happen before on tv you know what i mean like it's and it's such a hard thing to nail in horror is that kind of like 
bring it into reality. But when you do, and when you threaten people's security within reality while watching a film, that I think that's when horror really hits home. I, I couldn't agree more. And in fact, I've actually, I'm making a note here of uh, Deadstream and also Faith the Unholy Trinity um, because I'm wanting to check these out. If, they, if they've resonated with you, I'm, I'm, I'm wanting to uh, find out more about them um, because I think you're totally right. It is, if you can, it's a tough, um, it's sort of a tough, um, you know, combo to hit. But if you can, it can be really, it can be really special. Yeah, yeah. And and did you guys? Um, what I meant to ask as well is, there's like, a, there's three directors listed. So did you guys like split the workload, or were you guys all doing everything at once? Kind of everybody doing a certain task. It was it was really more of it was more of the latter. Um, we had from the outset we had a two thirds rule. So if we were, and we would spend we spent hours. You know, I I mentioned earlier that like there wasn't necessarily a script but at the same time there really there was um in the sense of like this all has to logically make sense and so there would be we would have long discussions um and sometimes pretty passionate ones about like no 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 this is how it has to be and so we had a two-thirds rule which was if we couldn't be unanimous on something if two if two people agreed that was then then the other the, the, then the person who disagreed had to go along with it and that, and it worked, and we came out of it. Um, it was a, it was a long process um, because we were shooting around full time jobs and and all of that. Um, we, we were at it for a number of years, and we had some you know our, some challenges in the editing process and um, the post production house or the editing house that we were working with had sort of made some promises that maybe. Now, they maybe hadn't made promises, but there were some understandings that like things took longer and there were technical issues. And but we, the three of us, emerged, you know, stronger friends than when we went into it. Um, and there would also the advantage of three. I mean, it's it's probably not, you know, they sort of always say like when you're making a movie, you shouldn't have multiple directors and you shouldn't have a lot of different locations and you shouldn't have vision kind of a thing. Yeah, and you should have a script, you know, like pretty much all of the rules that you should do, we did none of them, and it managed to work out. Um, and I would I guess say, the kind of movie that you guys were making, that organic factor of it is so vital. Yes, completely. And and I I think what was really great was that each one of us brings a slightly different um, knowledge base to it and level of experience in certain areas um and had you know and so but we all we collaborated really well together uh truthfully it was a, that was a lot of fun and we um we stayed connected to this day i'm i'm actually on the east coast at the moment but i'm um they're both in california but i'm hoping to be back in california very soon so that we can we can sort of get together again um and did um i speaking to that did you um was one of the main contentious points that I have with my friend and we argue about it a lot about the movie because we're both super into it um is the ending and it's the only part that um I I actually I quite liked it but he he said that he he didn't like how how that happened he was like oh I I would have much rather if it was like a blood trail and then you saw the body was that a thing that you guys argued about is how you were going to kind of knit it together at the end like kind of how you were going to do that last scene we spent a lot of time talking about that and and doing di different variations on it, um, and yeah. So that probably when you said that something that you and your friend disagreed on, I I would have put down a lot of money on the fact that it was probably the ending because I think um, it's kind of polarizing in the sense that I think a lot of people like it and a lot of people don't like it. Um, and that's to and that's totally fine. And I think, but we were aware that. We wanted to end it in a. We wanted to have a particular ending. Our original ending, like way way back when we first conceived it, was pretty. Um, it just was not would not have worked, um, and so it was it was a it was a source of you know of a lot of discussion and like okay how do we how do we pull this thing off like how do we really tie it up in a bow in the right way because we want to have some sort of a conclusion. But also, you know, we don't want to just end on like, and it's and they're going north. You know, like we don't want to just end on like, well, 
there you have it. Uh, what his, some crazy things. Uh, Sorry, go ahead. No, no. It's fine. Uh, his um take on it, uh, if I can remember correctly, was that it. Uh, what he said it should have been was um, it should have been all of the characters back over again. Um, and throughout the movie, he was like, "Oh, if they'd put like fake television, like newsreels of like an infection spreading or something," and I was like, "Yeah, but I, I, I think then." The payoff would have had to been grand where there's like a bunch of zombies and stuff i really like the low scale kind of like there's a there's one of them out there and that means the other ones aren't gone either you know that kind of thing where it, it leads it up it leaves it up to you to decide kind of how far it went after that totally and like one of the i had wanted you know like way way back i had been like man it would be cool if there was like you know I almost uh, the scene that I ended, you know, that I described, it was really something like straight out of World War Z in the sense of like, a, you know, like a, we're we're pulling back from behind a big wall and we see this like, you know, city in ruins or something like that. Like yeah. that was just but it was just too big and it was too um, uh, not in keeping with the the size of the film that we just made to say nothing of the fact that we didn't have the budget for it. I, um, I, I think the great thing about it, too, is that you could pick a lot of movies and a lot of universes where this movie could just slip in as and i said world War Z earlier but thinking about it like it could just slip in as like a product that came out within that universe because of a zombie outbreak or because there's these creatures out there yes and, um, yep it really adds to the i mean and a big thing with like the movie in general is that i really like how um it sucks you in as the viewer being a character because suddenly you're if this was screened in this universe the viewer would have been instrumental in what do they think and then suddenly you're taking that role of kind of playing detective yourself as, as it goes along of like okay so what's happening and then as the movie goes on you kind of you get all the pieces without the biases and stuff and i i thought that was really great it's a great way to engage your audience no i appreciate that because that was something yeah that we had thought about like is you know sort of really pull, pulling trying to pull people in um and, and and connect and you know to borrow your word to engage yeah well um david it's been really 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 great talking to you um we kevin this has been a blast it's genuinely i've genuinely appreciated it it's been a lot of fun yeah and it, and, great I mean, I, yeah i it may sound silly to say but i'm coming away from it sort of more inspired than ever. I'm going to check out a couple of the things that you've recommended that I haven't seen or pl uh, played yet. And I'm, I'm, this is awesome. Thank you very much. Yeah, no problem at all. No, it's been great talking to you and even about like how horror is constructed and stuff. It's really cool to see, to, to, to hear, um, to hear your take on it as someone who made something like Savage Land and like hear how you, you know, how the narrative should work and stuff. It's been, it's been, yeah, as you said, a blast, been a lot of fun. No, thank you very much. I, I appreciate you uh, for having me on. Yeah, yeah, no problem. I mean, anytime. If you ever want to come back, uh, we'd be more than, <laughs> we'd be more than happy. Oh, totally. Yeah, I'd be. Uh, yeah, and I was gonna say, and I'm, I'm, you know, so I'm so uh, sorry to hear that your your co-host is uh, has taken to the bed. But um, you know, if if when he's well, if you guys want to do anything, or if you if you listen to this back and you're like, ah, this wasn't very good, I'm happy. Like. This has been a lot of fun. So. This has been this has been fantastic. But um, uh, but uh, we've yeah. I I feel like we covered a lot of ground, and it's and again, uh, Todd Savage Land is it's up there in my top tens on my letterbox for people to watch it. I think it's fantastic, and I think it's a uh, it's a movie that uh will have a pretty. I think it already does, but it it's cult following will get a lot grander as time goes on. That's been, like I said, it's it's been it 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 has gone beyond our wildest dreams. Certainly, my own wildest dreams in terms of uh, people connecting with it and 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 tweeting about it and talking about it and getting the chance to talk with you about it has been. I I never would have imagined something like this. Yeah, well, it's it's been a pleasure. It's been an honor to talk to you about it, and um, and uh, I wish you luck and everything, and I really hope. As you said earlier, um, something comes out of talking about making more Savage Land or something like it. Um, be really, really cool to see. Definitely. I will keep you posted. And please, uh, stay in touch. Don't be a stranger. Oh, yeah. No, no, no. Don't worry. You can't get rid of me now. <laughs> Excellent. No, I'm, I'm thrilled to hear that. <laughs> uh, all right, David. Um, I'm going to let you go, but it's...
been great. Terrific. Thank you so much, Kevin. No problem. Thank you, David. And uh, that was uh, David Wheelan on Savage Land, everybody. Uh, really, really, really great conversation. Um, I think some of the takeaways to take there are how horror narrative works and how audience belief is instrumental. Um, it's going to be a lot of arguments about that. <laughs> but uh, yeah, no, that was fantastic. Um, hopefully we'll have David on again. Thanks everybody for listening. Uh, this has been In Conversation With. Thank you.